Off the rails and off the radar. From line three to line free, it's bon voyage to the Scarborough RT as the TTC trashes the trains. Good evening service is suspended and it will not resume. Commuter is already familiar with transit turmoil. Dealt another detour. From derailed to decommissioned. Getting around in the East End is anything but an easy ride. CTV's Mike Walker is live with our top story. Mike. Well, the TTC is decommissioning the line ahead of schedule because of the amount of time it's taking to complete the investigation into last month's derailment. It is enhancing shuttle bus service, but many riders we spoke with today are expressing frustration. Jessica Sanchez commute to work in Ajax has increased by nearly an hour since a derailment ended service on line three last month. Really frustrating. It's like I had to wake up a lot earlier than I had to before. A commute that also includes connecting with a GO bus at Scarborough Town Center. I would have been there by now. Sanchez thought the shuttle bus would only be temporary, but today the TTC announced it's permanently ending service on the Scarborough Rapid Transit line earlier than planned. You can only do so much, like there's traffic. I don't know what more shuttle buses would do. The transit agency says it's decommissioning the line now instead of November because of how long the investigation into the July 24th derailment is taking. We thought it was going to be three weeks, then it turned into five weeks. We still, it looks like we have a couple more weeks. So really in the meantime, uh, we were doing our level best to make sure we had the best shuttle service we could. The TTC and city already implementing its rail replacement plan, including bus only lanes, southbound on Midland and northbound on Kennedy between Eglinton and Ellesmere. The new shuttle bus route will be implemented this weekend. And really now it's about giving people the certainty of what their trip planning will look like. Line 3 is being decommissioned due to aging infrastructure. The long-term plan is to have buses running along the RT corridor until the Scarborough subway extension is complete. But for now, the riders who make up the 30,000 trips each day will have to rely on shuttle buses. I actually don't, don't like the shuttle buses. They take forever. And waiting for the buses are hell. They should have thought about all this years ago when they told them that they needed the repairs. Transit advocates argue the line is ending without reliable solutions. We need to see red bus only lanes on the road, transit signal priority at traffic lights for the 70 shuttle buses per hour that are needed to replace the RT. And the provincial government still hasn't provided funding for a busway. The TTC chair says the decision is not surprising and is confident with the interim plan. What I'm looking for now is the implementation. Uh, we've given specific deadlines as to when we want these, this implemented by. Uh, one of them being is to have the, the interim shuttle bus replacement service ready by back to school. As for Sanchez, she's packed a suitcase to stay with family near her work. Because of like the inconvenience it is. Well, she looks for alternatives. The TTC and city are also looking at how they can build the busway along the RT corridor sooner. Reporting live in Scarborough, Mike Walker. Nathan, back to you. All right, thank you, Mike. From your commute to your cost of living, if you call Toronto home, you're going to be paying more. A new mayor and now new taxes. Whether you're running a city or looking after your family's books, we all have to about a budget to balance. So how much of a hike should residents be expecting? TTV's Natalie Johnson is live at City Hall with more. Natalie. Well, Michelle, just in the last hour, Mayor Olivia Chow's executive committee signed off on a slate of new taxes suggested by the city manager. That means that city council will be asked to approve changes to the land transfer tax, parking fees and more. Toronto taxpayers will soon be asked to pay more at a time when the mayor says she knows the cost of living is up. I totally get it. People are struggling to make ends meet. But so is the city. Toronto's top bureaucrat underscoring that City Hall is facing a financial crisis and needs new taxes to avoid slashing services. If it was easy, we would have found it already. Approved by Chow's inner circle today, an increase to the land transfer tax on luxury homes, a foreign buyer land transfer tax, hiking the vacant home tax, and removing the $5 per hour on-street parking rate cap. When residents ask about, you know, I need more services, I'm like, well, we have to pay for them. They understand that we have a lot of needs in the city of Toronto and not the fiscal tools to meet those needs. They are also asking council to seek approval for a municipal sales tax, <laughs> pursue a monthly fee on phone users to cover 911 costs, and consider a commercial parking levy. There's a deliberate look to try to make sure that the tax burden goes more on to people that can afford it. We should tax the rich. 
The rich have left the city. Members of the public made their case to committee. The commercial parking levy is one way to take one step towards repairing our failed transit system. It would avoid us needing to slash services more. I asked for the committee to consider potentially excluding hotels from the parking levy. Why aren't we having a vehicle registration tax? We do need a flexible tool, and I think the parking levy really fulfills that requirement. I am hopeful that the era of austerity and cutting services at City Hall is over. While others insist now is not the time to tax. Here we have people lined up at the executive committee lamenting the rising cost of living and at the same time a city government that is looking to raise taxes. I would say 95% of them are saying that uh, it's time, do something, plan ahead, be brave, be bold. That's unanimous. Thank you very, very much. Olivia Chow will now need to convince council to sign off. And so unanimous support for the plan at executive committee today, though the tougher vote for Mayor Chow will be when this goes to council. It will be one of the first big tests of her leadership here. That will happen in two weeks time. And at that point, Torontonians will find out exactly how much more they'll be taxed. Reporting live at City Hall, I'm Natalie Johnson. Michelle, over to you. Thank you, Natalie. Meanwhile, a new poll shows most Torontonians are pleased with the job Mayor Olivia Chow has done since taking office in July. Liaison Strategies surveyed 816 residents by phone last weekend. 73% said they approve of the new mayor after her first month, while 18% disapprove. City Council got a 57% ranking. The margin of error was 2.71 percentage points, 19 times out of 20. They work fast and their tactics are terrifying. A slew of carjacking investigations north of the city. And tonight, police are wondering whether the same people are behind the chilling and costly robberies. CTV's Janice Golding is live with more. Janice. Hi, Nathan. Yes, police are warning the public after three separate carjackings in less than a week here in Markham, which they believe involve the same suspects. This video released by York Regional Police shows exactly how people are getting carjacked. When they come to a stop at a traffic light or a stop sign, they're lightly tapped from behind by the suspects. When the uh, victim and the suspects get out to inspect the damage, that's when the victims approach. Sometimes they've been carrying a knife, sometimes a baton, and then they'll make the demand for their vehicle keys and take off in their car. Police believe the same suspects are responsible for three separate carjackings since Sunday. So on Sunday, August 20th, uh, there was, uh, the victim was stopped at the traffic light just here uh, when they were bumped from behind. The incidents are occurring during quiet times on the road between midnight and 4 a.m. And in each case, the victim's high-end luxury vehicle is struck lightly from behind to cause minimal damage. And then they turned north here onto Victoria Park and into this transit loop. When they pull over to check the damage and exchange information, they're approached by an armed suspect or suspects who are dressed all in black and wearing masks. Call 911 immediately. We're, we'll attend. We'll ch we attend all accidents on the road. We'll come and see if there is anything wrong um, while you're waiting keep your windows up and doors locked if you feel nervous just drive away your life is is more valuable than your car police say if you're involved in a minor accident like this don't get out of your car call 911 or go to your nearest police station in the incident that occurred behind us here at Victoria Park and Steeles, police say the victim ran away from the car screaming loudly and called 911, and they believe that scared the suspects away. The incident uh, did not involve any violence, and the vehicle was not stolen. In all three cases, police say the target vehicles were Mercedes. Reporting live from Janice Golding, now back to Nathan. All right, thank you, Janice. Elsewhere, police in Peel have arrested several teens in connection with two separate carjackings in Mississauga. On August 15th, police say a victim was forced out of her vehicle by suspects with edged weapons who then drove away. Yesterday, they arrested two 17-year-old boys in connection with the case. Then, late last night, a food delivery driver was forced from his vehicle by three suspects who drove away and were stopped by police. A 14-year-old and two 17-year-old boys faced charges, including robbery. 
to a CTV News investigation now. We've learned two men have pleaded guilty for their roles in conspiring to fake car crashes and defraud insurance companies in a case with ties to the GTA's tow truck turf wars. As CTV's John Woodward reports, observers say these pleas could have a big impact on the case against a key alleged co-conspirator, a Toronto police officer. Darren Cameron didn't want his face shown as he left Superior Court after a guilty plea this week to one count related to a sprawling insurance scam connected to Toronto's troubled tow truck industry. Yeah, I'm actually a victim in this case. Another guilty plea to 13 charges from tow truck driver Kevin Lima as he admitted in court a scheme he said involved Toronto Police Constable Ronald Joseph. It was a big project and they invested a lot of time, the police with undercover uh, police and uh, wiretaps and search warrants. In one case, court heard Royal Sun Insurance paid $72,000 for a stolen Ram truck. Joseph claimed to be a witness. In fact, Lima towed it away. In another, Lima and Joseph claimed a stolen Mercedes had been in a hit and run. The court heard the whole thing was staged. Joseph made an insurance claim for a Ford Escape he was renting. In reality, it had been damaged six months earlier, rear-ending a city bus. The total tally of paid or attempted claims listed in court was about $144,000, with one prosecutor saying Joseph cashed in another way. All three parties attempted to rent a car with Joseph's rental company, where he would financially benefit. Joseph and another man have pleaded not guilty to all of this. They're expected to go to trial in September. Joseph's lawyer has previously said he welcomes a hearing into these allegations because that's when he says the full story will come out. That's only one of several criminal charges against Joseph. He's also accused of cloning a police radio to get tow trucks to highway crashes faster and getting kickbacks for those tips. All part of a huge dragnet that has already netted a guilty plea from an officer in the OPP while the Ontario government has revamped regulations for tow trucks to try and stop corruption. Lima's lawyer won't say his guilty plea means he'll testify, but... Those are all things that uh, heavily enhance the strength of the uh, Crown Attorney's, uh, the prosecution case. Lima's yet to be sentenced. Cameron was given a suspended sentence and said he'll pay back about $17,000 by Friday. John Woodward, CTV News. And if you have something you'd like us to investigate, make sure to get in touch. Visit ctvnewstoronto.ca for secure and anonymous ways to share your story. Certainly not a washout day, but we got some doses of rain, plenty of cloud, rather calm conditions this hour as we take a live look outside. But there is the potential for some stormy weather overnight. Let's bring in Lindsay Morrison with a look at the current conditions. Uh, let us know what's coming our way. Well, Michelle, at this point, it looks as though the majority of the severe weather will likely be again across southwestern Ontario. We're going to talk about that part of the province in just a moment. In the last two hours, we had a few showers roll their way through the GTA. Uh, we're dry at the moment, but that could change. Still some lingering shower activity for eastern Durham region and Clarington. Here's a look at the severe thunderstorm watch that's in place for the southwest. Winds right now are coming from a southeasterly direction. It's not the heat, it's the humidity today. 21 degrees, feeling like 27, feeling into the 30s in many parts of our province. There's your evening at a glance. We'll talk about the potential for stormy weather into tomorrow, plus your weekend forecast is all coming up. For now, Nathan, over to you. All right, thank you, Lynn. As the Ford government faces questions over its handling of the Green Belt, Ontario's Green Party is calling for a public inquiry. People want transparency, they want accountability, and they want to know the truth. Green Party leader Mike Schreiner said the Auditor General's report raised new questions that are of significant public interest. The report found the Ford government favored certain developers when choosing where to remove Green Belt protections. The RCMP is now considering whether to launch a criminal investigation after the OPP referred the matter. Premier Doug Ford has said his government accepts most of the Auditor General's recommendations, but the land changes won't be reevaluated. He also said he believes no preferential treatment was given to developers. Provincial police are trying to figure out why an Amber Alert early this morning didn't get transmitted properly. OPP issued the alert just before 3.30 a.m. for a missing child northeast of Coburg. They've since been located, but police want to figure out why the alert wasn't received province-wide. We have full details on our website, ctvnewstoronto.ca. Durham police are investigating after a body was found in central Oshawa yesterday. Just after 5 p.m., officers responded to a call near Eulalie Avenue and James Street. They say the remains were found in a green space there. 
At this stage, investigators say there are no obvious signs of foul play, but they've ordered a post-mortem as the search for answers continues. There's also no word on the person's identity. Anyone with information is asked to contact Durham Regional Police. Border officials say they've made significant seizures over the summer to stop the flow of harmful drug products into Canada. The Canada Border Services Agency says between June and July, its officers intercepted more than 3.3 tons of precursor chemicals arriving from Asia. Officials say they're used to manufacture drugs like MDMA, also known as ecstasy. The CBSA says the product seizure may have prevented millions of doses of those drugs from reaching Canadian communities. You could call this pantless in Pickering. Police are searching for a suspect who allegedly robbed a couple of jewelry earlier this month. It happened August 7th, make that second, near Azalea Avenue and Burkholder Drive. Police say a man and woman were returning home when an unknown man approached them in the driveway and allegedly forcefully removed jewelry from one of them. A physical altercation ensued, and that resulted in the suspect being stripped of his shorts and shoes. Police have released a picture of the suspect and the vehicle it's believed he fled in. It is another significant day in the political history of our neighbors south of the border. Former U.S. President Donald Trump set to surrender to authorities in Georgia on charges he schemed to overturn the 2020 election in that state. CTV Zoraida Allman is tracking every development and joins us live. Zoraida. Nathan, Donald Trump is expected to land in Atlanta within the hour. While his plane remains in the air, so too is his fate as he prepares to face his fourth criminal indictment. This afternoon, Donald Trump's motorcade leaves New Jersey en route to the Newark airport. The former U.S. president on his way to Atlanta to turn himself in. Outside the Atlanta jailhouse, Trump's supporters gather, security on high alert. When he arrives, Trump is expected to be fingerprinted and in another first for a former U.S. president, have his mugshot taken. It is a circus like we've never seen in this country before, and that is saying something. And it's even a circus by Trumpian standards. Trump, along with 18 of his allies, including Rudy Giuliani. I'm being prosecuted right, for right, defending an American citizen who uh, I do as a lawyer. And former White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows facing organized criminal corruption charges in the Georgia election results. The defendants engaged in a criminal racketeering enterprise to overturn Georgia's presidential election result. Donald Trump attempting to capitalize on his indictments to support his presidential campaign, telling Tucker Carlson on the eve of his surrender the charges are nonsense. I'm so high in the polls because it means the people get it. The people see it's a fraud. Donald Trump has now been indicted in four separate criminal cases. The former president facing a total of more than 90 charges. And we also learned this afternoon the district attorney has requested a trial start date of October 23rd. Trump's lawyers have already filed a motion opposing it. He is set to be released today on a $200,000 bond. I'm Zoraida Allman. Nathan, back to you. All right, thank you, Zoraida. In B.C., there's been significant progress in the battle against wildfires threatening a number of communities. The evacuation order rescinds are continuing. Uh, there'll be more to come today and, and more in the future days. Uh, the weather uh, right now is in our favor, although we're always anticipating that may change. Crews continue to deal with hot spots, smoke and potential fires near West Kelowna across Lake Okanagan. Officials in Kelowna hope to let evacuees start returning today. Up to seven millimeters of rainfall in the region yesterday. It's not safe yet. Thousands of Yellowknife residents are being asked to stay away because a nearby wildfire is still a threat. No residents have been seeing, you know, blue skies, sunny. It was hot yesterday. It's hot today. It's going to be hot tomorrow. But those are actually not great things for the fire. Um, it, you know, it can, uh, it's forecasted to cause um, flare ups and what they call as crown fires, which means the fire goes from tree to tree. The evacuation order has been in place for more than a week now, and there is no set date for it to be lifted. Roadblocks have been set up to prevent residents from getting back in, and those who try may be reported to police. So might anyone who ignored the order to leave the city. They're being told to leave now. 
One day after the death of mercenary leader Yevgeny Prigozhin, two big questions have surfaced. What caused the plane crash and what does the future hold for the Wagner Group? CTV's Judy Trin reports. A growing makeshift memorial outside the St. Petersburg office of the Wagner Group. It marks the death of mercenary Evgeny Prigozhin, who died when his private plane plunged to the ground. President Vladimir Putin offered condolences to Prigozhin's family, calling his one-time ally a person with a complicated background who made serious mistakes. Mistakes like challenging Putin's authority by turning his private militia on Moscow in June. Today, Russian police descended on the crash site, protecting the scene for investigators to determine the cause. The plane could have experienced mechanical failure or something more sinister. The Pentagon has ruled out one theory. We don't have any information to indicate right now. Um, the press reporting uh, stating that there was some type of surface-to-air missile that took down the plane. That we assess that information to be inaccurate. Analysts doubt Russia's aviation authority will be transparent. On one hand, they want to say um, uh, this was an accident or they'll come up with some, some type of absurd uh, conclusion. And on the other side of their mouth, they want to like look everybody in the eye and say, this is what happens to traitors. But like the wreckage, Wagner's future could be in pieces. Many of the mercenaries had already deserted the war in Ukraine to seek amnesty in Belarus. Just three days ago, Prigozhin was in Central Africa trying to recruit new troops. Now, not only is Prigozhin dead, but so is his right-hand commander, Dmitry Utkin. We will just have to wait and see whether the Wagner group continues in a different iteration or whether Putin decides to close it down. Before his death, Prigozhin boasted he controlled 25,000 soldiers for hire. It's unclear how many of those troops will return to help Russia fight in its war against Ukraine. Judy Trin, CTV News, Ottawa. In Ukraine, there were enemy attacks across the country. At least one person was killed, 16 other civilians were injured. In Dnipro, 10 people were hurt when a Russian missile struck a bus terminal. More than 10 other buildings were damaged. Kherson and the frontline town of Karakhov were among other places hit. The attacks happened as Ukraine marked 32 years of independence from Moscow. The Canadian subsidiaries of three companies are being investigated following allegations related to forced labor. Canada's corporate ethics watchdog says Walmart, Hugo Boss and fashion firm Diesel have not done enough to prove their products are free of forced labor. They are accused of relying on suppliers who source materials from Uyghur people in China's Xinjiang region. All three say they uphold strong protocols against forced labor and investigate the source of their products. Walmart Canada released a statement saying the company does not tolerate forced labor of any kind in its supply chain and takes allegations of human rights violations seriously. It adds that none of the entities named in the complaint are in their active supply chain. We're getting a fresh look at the moon tonight, courtesy of India's lunar lander. These images were captured during yesterday's descent to the South Pole of our celestial neighbor. India is the first country to get there. The rover is expected to remain functional for two weeks, running a series of experiments. They include an analysis of the mineral composition of the lunar surface. The lander exited the spacecraft today. Back here on Earth, Leafs fans are hoping this might finally rocket the team into the stratosphere. The buds still buzzing around locking down Austin Matthews. It's done. Austin Matthews will become the highest paid player in the NHL after signing a four-year contract extension for $53 million. Personally, I like the deal. Uh, past couple of years, he put up some good numbers. He's a generational talent. At this pickup game in Scarborough, there's relief Matthews is staying in the blue and white. I like it. It's uh, If the Leafs are going to win, it's going to be with Matthews. I don't think they're going to win without him. The contract extension kicks in after the upcoming season. The 25-year-old will average $13.25 million a year. He's an elite player, and I think it's really going to inspire kids who, uh, who get to see him on TV every single night uh, and inspire them to want to continue playing the game. So I think it's great for hockey, great for the city of Toronto. Uh, we're very excited for it, so let's see if he can help us to bring us a Stanley Cup title home. Matthews tweeting, 
I feel fortunate to continue this journey as a Maple Leaf in front of the best fans in hockey. I will do everything I can to help get us to the top of the mountain. We know he's a big part of the future here. Captain John Tavares is thrilled with the deal. His maturity and, and the, the way he's grown has been extremely impressive. And, you know, he wants to be here. Matthew scored 40 goals last season and registered 85 points in 74 games. It means for 82 games, the Maple Leafs will be one of the top teams. They will score goals. Whether they can get over the mountain, I don't know. Like Matthews, his points per game, his goals per game go down from the regular season into the playoffs. Leafs legend and former captain Wendell Clark weighing in on the deal. Well, he's awesome. He's one of the best players in the league. He's got the contract like he is. He's earned it. He's a great hockey player. And we need him to keep playing at that highest level. Now the focus shifts to another member of the core four, William Nylander, who's in the final year of his contract. I hope he does. You know, everyone needs their number two. And I think that that would be Austin's number two would be Nylander. He's an incredible player. He's so dynamic. Pretty confident they'll get him back. If not, I'm sure we can get something good for him. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, whatever they're doing for our team, I like right now. And the Maple Leafs preseason schedule starts exactly one month from today, September 24th, versus the Ottawa Senators. Their regular season campaign gets underway October 11th against Montreal. From the ice to the hardwood in Canada's roster for the FIBA's Men's Basketball World Cup is now set. The team will be led by all-star guard Shea Gilgis-Alexander of the Oklahoma City Thunder, guard R.J. Barrett of the New York Knicks, and center Kelly Olynyk of the Utah Jazz. 15th-ranked Canada has seven NBA players on its roster announced today. Our first game is Friday against France. Canada can qualify for the Olympics with a top-two finish among these seven America's teams. Well, it is a playground for all things comics, anime, sci-fi, gaming, and cosplay. We'll take you live to Fan Expo, now underway. Coming up, the sights, the sounds, and celebrity appearances. And I'm Pat Foran. Coming up on Consumer Alert, you now have more options flying out of Pearson Airport. A discount airline has added flights to Los Angeles and will add more destinations this fall. If you're planning to fly soon, there may be some deals to be had. I'll have my report just ahead. It's going to be mild tonight. Forecast low, 19 degrees, humid X 24. But in addition to the chance of showers and risk of thunderstorms, we'll also want to keep an eye out for fog. As for tomorrow, it's going to be a great day to head to the CNE. Gradual clearing as the day goes on and eventually sunshine. There's sun in store this weekend too. Details are coming up and stay with us. We've got another full night of great shows for you right here on CTV. After the pandemic, there was a huge demand for air travel, which led to big increases for ticket prices. But as summer comes to an end, analysts expect prices to come down this fall, and some discount airlines are offering seat sales and new destinations. Pat Foran has more on Consumer Alert. Pat. Thanks, Michelle and Nathan. If you try to fly on a budget, you now have more options than ever. Lynx Air, a discount airline, said today it's expanding its operations with plans to keep fares low. An industry analyst says the increased competition should be good news for flyers. Lynx Air cut a ribbon at Pearson Airport to celebrate the launch of its inaugural flight from Toronto to Los Angeles. The discount airline celebrated with a 25% off seat sale. You could get a ticket from Toronto to LA for $129 one way. Fares have been too high for too long. And Lynx Air aims to change that by bringing our ultra affordable fares to Toronto. Lynx took to the skies in Canada last year and is adding destinations, airplanes and offering low base fares, which it says are badly needed in the Ontario market. We think that uh, there's a lot of pent up demand for a good value fare um, airline like we are and an airline that provides a good customer service as well. Canadians now have their choice of several ultra low cost carriers, including Lynx, Flair, Swoop and Porter. As these smaller airlines grow, they hope to steal market share away from Canada's largest carriers, Air Canada and WestJet. Discount airlines are good for competition and their ticket prices are lower, but you may have to pay to check your bag, bring a carry-on bag on the flight and choose your seat. You may also have to pay extra to use a call center or change your flight. Well, that's how we enable, uh, are able to provide our ultra affordable fares, is allowing people to choose what they want and, and not purchase what they don't want. It will be a buyer's delight. John Graddick teaches aviation management at McGill University and says the traditional summer travel season in Canada is from May to September. 
He feels many low-cost carriers will be offering deep discounts to fill their seats this fall and winter. Lots of choices and lots of price competition. So, you know, there are, you know, the Canadian travelers, you know, prayers have been answered. As for Lynx Air, the company says it experienced 260% growth over last year with plans to add Phoenix, Fort Myers and Tampa to its schedule this fall. And those cheap seats don't last long and many tickets have already been snapped up. But if you're planning a trip over the next six months, it might be worth checking out what the discount carriers have to offer. On your side, I'm Pat Foran. If you have a consumer story idea, email us at alert at ctv.ca. A recent study is ranking Toronto among some of the worst cities to visit in the world when it comes to traffic. A UK company analyzed the world's most visited cities for tourism, crunching the numbers on factors like travel time and speed. Toronto ranked 13th worst around the globe, with drivers spending nearly 200 hours a year in rush hour traffic, rush hour speeds also tended to max out at 25 kilometers an hour. Brussels in Belgium took the title of worst city for driving. So at least we're not the worst. <laughs> right. And I'm thinking when it rains, it's even worse, the traffic, right? Mm. People don't know how to sometimes forget how to drive. Yeah, or people want an Uber. They don't want to be walking in the rain. And we did have some showers right around the rush hour, the commute home time today. Uh, it's tapered off for the time being, but we'll hold on to that chance of showers through the night tonight, maybe into tomorrow morning as well. But after that, I do see signs of improvement. Weather is brought to you by Train, the most reliable heating and cooling brand. It's hard to stop a train. Now let's talk about last night. This time yesterday there were heavy amounts of rain, absolutely drenching southwestern Ontario. And this was the result. We're looking at some video from Stony Point, which is near Lake St. Clair, not too far away from the Windsor area. And you can see the result flooding about eight inches of rain between about midnight until 8 a.m. this morning. That is a lot of rain in a very short period of time. And this wasn't the only location. Take a look at this summary by Environment Canada. A uh, Harrow picking up 185 millimeters of rain. Again, that's from last night to this morning. There was also some hail and some wind damage reported as a result of those storms. And it's still active in that part of the province. A few thunderstorms are expected to rumble through. We're still seeing some scattered showers. Nothing all that severe in nature at this point when it comes to thunderstorm activity. But there is potential as we make our way into the night tonight. It's not a guarantee. Let's set our forecast radar in motion. I'm going to step aside so you can see once again right where it's not needed. More heavy rain expected across the southwest over toward London. Heads up Hamilton over toward Niagara. I think this is where we have the best opportunity for some thunderstorm development through the night tonight. It'll likely be scattered showers through the overnight for us here in most parts of the GTA. Another night where you want to make sure that your patio cushions come inside. Early tomorrow morning, it's possible we could have a few showers. The afternoon, though, brings signs of improvement. I see some cloud cover breaking up, hopefully some sunshine before the day is finished. And then heading into Saturday, we could have on and off showers, but we will also have periods of sunshine. Just watch for the risk of thunderstorms, especially into the afternoon and especially across southwestern Ontario again. Current temperature here locally is 21 degrees. It does feel warmer than that. It feels like 27. There's tomorrow morning. Keep the umbrella handy for early on. Tomorrow afternoon looks muggy. 26, the forecast high. Feeling like 34. It might feel nice if we manage to get some of that sunshine. That's hopefully in store. Saturday, again, still bringing us the chance of some wet weather. Plenty of sun for your Sunday. It is going to be a little bit cooler with a daytime high of 22. And overall, a pretty pleasant looking seven day forecast right through the early part of next week. That's your look at the weather. Michelle, over to you. Thanks, Lindsay. We are getting a look tonight at the toll the housing crisis is taking on some international students. One young man speaking out about the crowded and difficult living conditions he's been enduring for months. CTV's Beth McDonnell reports. There are actually five rooms and they are not well uh, insulated. Step underground and it's easy to see walls in disrepair and tight living quarters in the basement of this small Scarborough bungalow. It's a kind of, uh, kind of torture or something like that. Since January, Ashish Sharma says more than a dozen people have stayed in the basement at different times, with more people living upstairs. He sleeps on a mattress on the floor next to another tenant. 
just for sleeping is okay. But if you want to study there and if you want to focus, um, it's a terrible place. First few months, I shared a mattress with somebody because there was no mattress available at that time. And after some time, um, uh, the, the uh, people, uh, the friends, uh, they collected the mattress from outside, maybe from the street, and they placed there. Sharma is often at the library. With so many roommates, it's the noise while trying to study, he says, is his biggest problem. The 25-year-old international student from Nepal has a degree in civil engineering and is studying construction management at George Brown College. He pays $25,000 in tuition. He says he looked at the college's accommodations, but they were too expensive, and he found this place on his own, paying around $500 a month. If I have to leave um, this place, uh, I have to. I think I have to pay more than this. Uh, Obviously, I think, and that's the one fear. And nowadays, for international students, it's really hard to uh, get a job. I spoke to the two owners of the home in person. They say they agree to move to a new country and live in these conditions is terrible and don't want to continue offering this type of housing. Police have attended the home, and Toronto Fire Services tell CTV News there is an investigation. The city says rooming houses are not currently allowed in Scarborough. The owners insist there are only 15 people in the entire house. They say they bought the home in December and monthly mortgage payments are over $5,000. After renting it to one person, they say they gave them the responsibility of collecting rent. The owners say they added a second bathroom in the basement, have fire alarms and upgraded the power supply. They're also aware of the investigation and say they've now warned tenants they'll have to move, but are most concerned with not throwing them out before having somewhere else to go. What I've heard is that he's living with a whole bunch of people and he's very unhappy. So I got my Irish up. Sharma and Lynn Laframboise attend the same church. Outraged, this week she offered to rent him a bedroom in her condo. I want Canada to be welcoming to people. We need people like him. And we know we do. We've opened up the universities and colleges to these people. And now we're saying you can fend for yourself. I don't think so. I think if most people knew what these um, immigrants have to deal with, that they would rise up. This week, the federal government said putting a cap on the number of international students coming to Canada is one solution it's considering to address the housing crisis. Sharma says he's very happy with his education at George Brown. He also believes a cap is a good idea as surviving right now is difficult. He hopes governments build more housing and schools offer more affordable options. In a statement, George Brown College says, we are deeply disturbed about the student's housing experience with a private landlord, and we will be following up directly with the student to provide additional supports. We understand the urgent need to create more housing options. We currently have a dedicated residence for our students. We also provide comprehensive supports and services tailored to meet the unique needs of our international student community, including financial literacy workshops, pre-arrival and post-arrival orientation sessions, and bursaries and awards. The college also says it recently expanded its international team with new student advisors, launched a housing task force, and is committed to collaborating with all sectors to facilitate more housing solutions. In the meantime, Sharma has decided to accept Laframboise's offer. I can study um, better there, so I'm really excited about this, and I'm very thankful to her. Giving him a more comfortable and stable start to life in Canada. Beth McDonnell. CTV News. Also tonight, know anyone who called in sick today? Maybe you did. Turns out this isn't just any old day in August. Today is the day more people in America call in sick. The fascinating findings just ahead. You might find yourself doing the odd double take this weekend. Yes, it's very possible that was indeed a superhero or anime character walking past you on the sidewalk. The country's biggest costume party is back in town, celebrating all things pop culture and fandom. CTV John Musselman is getting in on the fun, live from the start of Fan Expo. John. 
Well, Nathan, if you walk down Front Street, you're going to notice a lot of people in costumes. We'll just give you a shot here in the north building of the convention center. This place is packed, so is the south building. This is a celebration of everything you just mentioned, and it will last all weekend long. You might describe it as the biggest Halloween party held in the summer. I'm dressed up as a character from Dead by Daylight called Legion. Um, he's a, it's a killer. It's kind of throw quickly thrown together. I am Winnie the Pooh from Winnie the Pooh Blood and Honey. And what is that? It's a horror film off of Winnie the Pooh. And Winnie the Pooh gets hurt or is he the killer? He's the killer. So from Star Wars, like I'm when the Jedi die, they become one with the Force. So I'm the Force Ghost. It's called Fan Expo Canada. It's the largest comic, sci-fi, anime, and gaming event in Canada, and the third largest pop culture event in North America. Well, that's just a way the fans celebrate uh, many of the characters that they know and love. Uh, they dress up, they spend weeks, a lot of money sometimes on making really authentic costumes uh, that portray these characters that they really love, that mean a lot to them. And they stop each other for photos, they bump into someone else that's dressed as the same character. So it's a big part of connecting through pop culture. The show has grown from a small comic book convention attracting 1,500 fans, organizers say, into this multifaceted and multi-day citywide event that attracts hundreds of thousands of people from around the country and the world. This is my first time here, and seeing just the variety of people, the variety of costumes, the variety of, of, uh, of walks of life, uh, I feel like I have found my people. The, uh, the proton pack, yeah, so how complicated was that? Tell us. So I started out with a Spirit Halloween one, yeah. and just kind of went from there with my own ideas, using a 3D printer to just add stuff in and decided I just wanted to do something unique. Oh, just everything, just the whole anime, just the whole community, just everyone. Well, I'm wearing um, a cosplay Scaramouche from Genshin Impact. Um, I made the hat myself uh, along with the beads and, and then I bought the rest of it. Can I ask you, uh, do you get warm in there? Yes, really warm, yeah. How, how hot are you right now? Really hot. <laughs> So there's all kinds of vendors here, exhibits, so will even be some celebrity autograph signings from some of these sci-fi movies all throughout the weekend. Reporting live from the Convention Center, I'm John Musselman. I'll send it back to you. All right, thank you, John. Ed Sheeran told fans today he's dropping a new album next month, all to do with the change in seasons. Autumn is a season with a lot of change. You're coming out of summer. People are getting out of relationships, getting into relationships, uh, being very lonely. I just found my friends and me were all going through sort of different things in autumn, and I just thought it would be a, an interesting subject to write about. This. The Grammy winner also revealed the album cover for Autumn Variations, which will go out on September 29th. There's a new title at the top of North America's box office for 2023, and you probably won't be surprised by which one it is. Hi, Barbie. Hi, Ken. After surpassing several other milestones, Barbie is now the highest grossing movie of the year across the U.S. and Canada. It just surpassed $575 million U.S. That helped it overtake the previous number one, the Super Mario Brothers movie, at $574 million. Stars Tonight is brought to you by Lastman's Bad Boy. Who's better? Nobody. Scarborough Westerns deserve so much better. Updating our top stories, it's the end of the line for the TTC's Line 3. As officials say, the Scarborough RT will not resume service after last month's derailment. There were already plans to replace the line with an enhanced bus shuttle until Line 2 is extended to the area. We have a lot of needs in the city of Toronto and not the fiscal tools to meet those needs. At City Hall today, Mayor Chow and councillors heard from members of the public on plans to raise taxes and fees to balance Toronto's budget. Ideas on the table include an increased land transfer tax on luxury homes, a commercial parking levy, and a municipal sales tax. It is a circus like we've never seen in this country before. And we're keeping a close eye on developments out of Atlanta, where former U.S. President Donald Trump is set to surrender to authorities. This is in connection with criminal corruption charges relating to Georgia's 2020 vote count. Trump has denied all wrongdoing. He's now indicted in four cases while campaigning for his old job back. On the markets, the Canadian dollar is down about a third of a cent to 73.64 U.S. American Benchmark Oil adding 16 cents, closing at $79.05 U.S. a barrel. 
And the TSX Composite Index sliding 103 points, ending the day at 19,975.83. Did you call in sick from work today? A new study from south of the border suggests you may have been far from alone. Employee services firm Flamingo looked at the data from 300 U.S. businesses with more than 10,000 employees. On average, 0.9% of their workers were out sick on August 24th each year. Stomach bugs were the usual reason for calling in ill, surpassing COVID. There were also higher reports of anxiety and stress conditions. Tonight, a world title up for grabs. The number one safety thing with arm wrestling is that you always look at your hand. A Canadian arm wrestling champions rise to the top. That's coming up later on CTV National News. Not, rad, not bad right now, but we do have unsettled weather potentially pushing in overnight and tomorrow. Yeah, maybe a few showers as early as this evening. More likely as we make our way into the overnight. In fact, I also see a couple of cells starting to develop near the shoreline of Lake Huron. Here's what that looks like on the satellite and radar. Just keep the umbrella handy if you're going to be out this evening. Tomorrow, we're going to see gradual improvements through the day looking like a good one to maybe go out for a round of golf. Just be mindful of the fact that there could be a few scattered showers. Weekend forecast looks pretty good if you're headed to cottage country. Better chance of wet weather Saturday compared to Sunday. Sunday is cooler, but look at all that sunshine. Nathan and Michelle. All right, thank you, Lindsay. Be sure to join Amory Medawake tonight at 11 for CTV National News, followed by Zerada Allman with our next local newscast at 11.30. In the meantime, our coverage continues anytime on CP24 and online at ctvnewstoronto.ca. For Lindsay Morrison and all of us at CTV News, thank you for watching and have a good night.